an ironic media production. Visit us at I-R-O-N-I-C-K media.com. People then started supporting my work and providing me with more samples and, and data. And we had this crazy idea that there might be a second gene there or like right next to it in this location of the genome. I got really into this idea and even got a fellowship then to pursue this idea. And so that's how I came to Duke University. Oh, okay. Went to fellowship. Duke. Yep. They paid one year research experience at, at Duke. And this is where I then pretty quickly discovered the Mitofusin 2 gene, which of course is the most important CMT2 gene. So what, that was, what type of CMT does that translate to? It's a CMT 2A. 2A. Okay. And yeah. Stefan, that is a gene that you discovered? Yeah. Through wow. your time at Duke? We often say, oh, he discovered this. He could, that one I can, I can probably claim. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. This is Chris and Lizzo. And we are a brother-sister team. On behalf of the Charcot Marie Tooth Association, a.k.a. CMTA, we're coming at you. Coming at you from coast to coast. I live in California and my brother Chris is in Vermont. And this is another entertaining episode of our famous podcast named what, Lizzo? CMT for me. That's right. CMT for me. A comprehensive podcast covering all aspects of CMT, the voice of individuals living with CMT, their challenges, and more importantly, their inspirational stories. We will also cover research updates, fundraising, interviews with the CMTA community, board members, branch leaders, CMTA leaders, and overall, an opportunity to spread awareness through the eyes of those with CMT. Hey, Chris, what's new in Vermont? What's going on? Oh, boy, Lizzo, I have been busy. I was out once again gathering silent auction items for the Cycle and Walk for CMT event and stumbled into the ski rack, one of the Cycle for CMT original sponsors. So cool. They gave me a Patagonia duffel bag for our silent auction. Now, the good part. A ski rack employee asked me, what is this event all about? So I said, have you heard about CMT? What do you think she said, Lizzo? She probably looked at you like you were speaking a foreign language. Yes, you are correct, Lizzo. She had no clue. However, I seized the opportunity and gave her a one-minute explanation. The story gets even better. What do you think she asked next? Well, she's probably like, what causes CMT? Bingo. Boy, was I in trouble. I said, let me tell you more. Some sort of gene called PMP22. I believe she was thinking Levi genes as she glanced at my pants. I said, your nerves have myelin, which protects the axon, signals get blocked, progression, your muscles atrophy, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line, I said, CMT sucks. Boy, did I fail miserably. What do you think she asked next? Well, I hope she asked about research and why we're raising money for a cure. Right on. Sure, she did. My response? Oh, yeah, tons, a boatload, CRISPR, clinical trials, gene therapy, small molecules, biomarkers, drug development programs. I continued. I said, there's even one German research dude who discovered mutations with a spear or a sword. He used a sword to dissect a gene. Wow, she said, that is so cool. (laughs) Well, Chris, we'll have to clear that up with Stefan. But I have the perfect solution to some of our challenges on CMT research. This leads me to Stefan, our next guest, the distinguished and most reputable Dr. Stefan Zuckner. Isn't that a German name? Cool. A great opportunity to brush the dust off my German vocabulary. As you can recall from other episodes, I spoke French and even spoke with the British accent. Hello, we get this dear, Stefan. I think that means hi, Stefan. How are you? Yes, it does. Woe becomes to Diner Schneiden. <laughs> Chris, I think that means if Stefan understood, where do you get your haircut? Oh, it does. Do <laughs> guess me often, Nafu? <laughs> now it says, and this is true for you, you're getting on my nerves. Lizzo, so what do you think of my incredible German? Sehr schlecht. Very bad. So, 
Let's move on. This guy, <laughs> Stefan, what an impressive bio, Lizzo. As I was reading Stefan's bio, it made me reflect on my college organic chemistry class, which I barely passed. Did you ever take chemistry, Lizzo? Yeah, my science career ended after Sister Mildred's chemistry class, sophomore oh. year in high school. Oh, my goodness. So let's continue. A brief overview of Stefan's bio. Listen to this. MD and PhD, CMTA Scientific Advisory Board, Professor of Human Genetics and Neurology, Co-Director, John P. Hussman Institute for Human Genomics, Experience in Genome Sequencing Methods for Disease Gene Identification, hundreds of publications. Lizzo, I went online and it said like 250. I just, I couldn't read them all. And on top of this, Stefan, I think, is probably one of the most handsome docs focusing on CMT. What do you think, Lizzo? Do you agree? I totally agree. It's like you go to see Stefan because it makes you feel better. Actually, Stefan is the cure for CMT. You just look at him. Right on. There you go. So to our listeners, this may all sound confusing. However, we'll ask Stefan to clarify some commonly asked questions and misinformation, a great learning opportunity for all of us. So with that said, how you doing, Stefan? Thanks for joining us today. Very good. Thank you. This sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, perfect. So we're going to get started. Listen, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of where you were born, your age? Are you married? Do you have children? You know, where do you live now? Oh, yeah. As you already found out, I wasn't born in this country. I was born in Germany. Yeah. And in fact, what might even be more interesting, I was born in Berlin, but in East Berlin. I was born and I grew up in East Germany. And you probably remember the Berlin Wall? Sure yes. do. I was on the other side, unfortunately, which you can imagine was an interesting experience. Do you remember and that wall coming down? Yes. I, I always consider my birth year, we were the lucky year because I just finished high school that summer, before the summer of 89. Okay. And so I was ready to go out to go to college and boom, the Berlin Wall came down wow. that fall. So I was ready to embrace the new situation. And sure enough, by the end of that year, 89, I left my home country and went to the other Germany, West Germany, which was a different country at the time. Sure. Different money, different everything. Different culture, really. Culture, different. Yeah. So eventually I started med school about a year later then in Frankfurt, which is in West Germany. But then the reunification happened, actually. And so then it was one big Germany again. So I went to med school in Frankfurt. And then two years later, I switched to a place called RWTH Aachen, hmm. which is the University of Aachen. Aachen being, being a, a, a city. It's, it's a very good university. This is where I finished my medical school and did my clinical training. Wow. Yeah. And in fact, when I sort of looked for a medical PhD topic, I ended up in the neuropathology department. So what is neuropathology? The pathologists are those doctors who don't see many patients alive. They see oh, them okay. after and they, they, you know, they un try to understand why people got sick in the first place. But they also do a very important job in diagnostics, everyday diagnostics that you never see them. But they would... When you have a skin biopsy at your dermatologist or so, then a pathologist will look at this. If you have an operation, a pathologist will look if, if everything is all right or not. Wait, were Started. you working in like a lab with all these cadavers, just like dissecting people? I was dissecting tissue and, and dead people for sure. Actually, believe it or not, there's neuropathologists. They specialize just in you know, nerve tissue, which is, of course, the brain and the spinal cord, but also the peripheral nerve. And often the neuropathologists also look at muscles. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And, the, and all the rest, they leave to the pathologist. So it was quite specialized. So I started in neuropathology, do my research there. And it turned out that there was a the German center, the sort of the reference center for neuromuscular disorders, especially of peripheral nerve disorders. So I happenstance, I ended up learning a lot about the nerves that run in your legs and arms and 
I got a lot of biopsies at the time. That was in the late 90s. And I, I started reading biopsies, but doing also research in the lab. Yeah. But you're a trained neurologist too, right, Stefan? So yeah, after med school, I, I started my residence in neurology. So I did the job of duty, learning neurology sort of at, at, at ground level, yeah. seeing patients in the ER, running stroke patients to their treatments and diagnostics and taking care of patients in the, in the neurology ward. Wow. So my son, Johan, remembers you when we went to Detroit and you were with a group of physicians or neurologists examining people to get the neurology scores down pat and standardized. He remembers you as someone who tortured him by like pinpricking him, like tapping on his knees. One of the oh many that tortured him that day. So he'll never forget that. But you guys were actually, he was just joking. But yeah, it was yeah. like a series of 10 people, one after the other, doing the same standardized test. And he'll never forgive me because he was sick and I made him go and whatever. No. But <laughs> yeah, I did. This is really those volunteers. Is fantastic. A uh, bunch of doctors, you know, from all actually all over the world, I think, uh, all over the yes. country for sure. And they keep coming at you, and then not everything we do is exactly pleasant. I mean, it's not so bad, but no, it's not yeah, so right. bad. He's, he's kind of a whiner sometimes. So, yeah. you know, and it's needed and it's necessary. So, Stefan, just going back in time a little bit, I'm always curious as you were growing up, did you always have an interest in science? Did you know from a young age that you wanted to do research or how did you evolve into the position where you're at today? I, it's always easy to connect the dots in hindsight, hmm. but it's nearly impossible to project it out from where you are now. So as a small kid, I, I think I was always interested in, in sort of science things. I, I like to read science fiction when I was a boy. I, I do remember even, well, it must have been in the 70s, early 80s. I, I do remember talking to friends about sort of rockets, space, you know, space yeah. science stuff. So Sure. And then in school, I mean, I have to say, for me at least, good thing about the Eastern European approach to education, it was very science-based. We had to take chemistry, biology, mathematics, physics. Everybody had to take everything. Yeah. But so they put a big emphasis on science. I got a pretty broad overview of, of scientific issues, which I liked. So it was good for me. I, I, I liked that. I even was one of those kids. In fact, one summer, I remember, must have been like seventh grade or so, eighth grade. I went to a summer chemistry geek summer thing, you know, <laughs> like I remember that it, it yeah. made it a lot of fun. So somehow I got into this. I don't remember how, but. So yeah. I, I guess the teachers around me, they saw something and, and picked me to go to this camp. So, so my, why my, CMT? My, How did you get involved in CMT? You know, I'm fast forwarding a lot, but, you know, CMT and I know maybe you do some ALS and other things like this. But why CMT? Because you are the guru of you are the genetic the geneticist for CMT. And you've discovered a lot of genes and you have a lot of studies out there. And what you've done is pretty remarkable. So why CMT? You're very kind, Liz. There are Liz, a lot of great... Lizzo is honest. So there are a lot of great people in, in, in CMT geneticists, especially. It's remarkable. You may not realize many of our great sort of living genetic researchers in the world had their hands in CMT at some point in their career. It, it's true. Going to this neuropathology experience in Aachen was complete or accident. And then after my general neurology training, I came back to that neuro neuropathology training. I actually did some couple, a few more years of neuropathology training, the entire broad-based training. And I might have become a neuropathologist in another life. But then I, I, I went deeper into this topic. And I actually then got drawn one reason to be there was because they did genetics. They did neuropathology and genetics. So I got naturally drawn into genetics of peripheral nerves. Mm. And that was in the early 2000s, like 2001 or so. And I remember at the time, the first gene for the CMT2, right? The listeners probably know what CMT2 means. That's the, right. it's one of the two major forms, the CMT1 and CMT2. The rich genes at the time for CMT1, like you already mentioned PMP22 and others, MPC, 
those were known. They were discovered in the 1990s. And then only, I believe, in 2000, the first gene was found for CMT2, but it was a somewhat minor gene. And the major gene that everybody expected wasn't known. And then... What was that minor gene? What type of CMT was that? Two? It was neurofilament light uh, was the first one. 2E? Two 2E, two correct. I was there not knowing too much about genetics, training as a neuropathologist. And a big paper came out saying that the, they found these, the CMT2 gene. And there was a conference that year also where I went to in Belgium. And it was sort of, okay, that's it. And there were actually several groups around the world working on finding these genes. And they basically dropped their pencils. This gene was called KIF1B, KIF1B. And so we had several CMT2 families. And then I thought, okay, I'm new to this. I started screening them. And I just could not find any mutations, any changes in this gene. At the time, it was all very, very manual, very labor intensive. So I, I thought maybe I'm doing something wrong. And so when you say it was labor intensive, you would take a skin biopsy, then study it, or no, how, how, or DNA, blood, so, so, so blood cells, blood, DNA, saliva. Uh, but you know, today we sequence entire genomes. At the time, you could sequence little snippets of a single gene. Something was weird. And I thought it's probably me because I'm inexperienced. But then at this meeting, I presented this and people actually said, no, oh, maybe you're onto something. Maybe huh. there's another gene there or something. Somehow people then started supporting my work and providing me with more samples and, and data. And we had this crazy idea that there might be a second gene there or like right next to it in this location of the genome. I got really into this idea and even got a fellowship then to pursue this idea. And so that's how I came to Duke University. Oh, okay. Went to fellowship. Duke. Yep. They paid one year research experience at, at Duke. And this is where I then pretty quickly discovered the Mitofusin 2 gene, which of course is the most important CMT2 gene. So what, that, what type of CMT does that translate to? It's a CMT2A. To A. Okay. And yeah. Stefan, that is a gene that you discovered? Yeah. Through wow. your time at Duke? We often say, oh, he discovered this. He could, that one I can, I can probably claim. <laughs> All right. All That's right. amazing. Interesting. And so from that work, did other things unravel and make sense? Yeah. But, but again, you know, I mean, since people always get very emotional about discovery and who discovered, but generally in genetics, it's always a team sport. And then the people who are often forgotten are the physicians, follow these families for years and years. And so it really is a team sport. But somebody lucky enough to have this job is in the lab and doing experiments, deciding on the next experiment and, and looking at the data. And at the time that that was me. So I had these hours where only I knew it on the whole planet. Right. Yeah. And wow. I knew it. <laughs> so, yeah. That's amazing. It is. It yeah. is. And so I, how I, many genes have you discovered, Stefan? Or would you yeah, say see, team effort where, discoveries? Liz, this is where it gets, you know, that's why I'm saying this gets yeah. tricky because who, who should get credit? And when you're in this phase of your career where you're actually still very hands-on, you are the person who, who knows it first because it comes fresh off the machine or you analyze the data first. But you're part of a team. So, yeah, sure. so it's a collaboration. Yeah, I guess closer to my group, I'd say maybe we discovered a couple dozen or so, but wow. then we supported the discovery of, of many more. Interesting. Yes. So, so Stefan, one thing I'm thinking about just in terms of our listeners. So that's cool, right? There's a discovery. You, you've spent a lot of your life focused on CMT. You discover genes. So as an individual, say, that has CMT, so you discover genes and then what comes next? What do you do after that? I mean, what's yeah. kind of the strategy or goal now that you've discovered this gene? Yeah. The big picture idea is quite simple, right? There is somebody with a disorder like CMT. They slowly lose their nerve function. Right. You can see it. Even pathologists can see that when they look at nerves, say, oh my God, the nerve is rumbling. So then the idea is what really is the cause here? Is it some toxic? influence from the food? Is it a virus like COVID? Is it, what is it? Sure. 
or is it a gene? So finding the root cause is the first simple but powerful concept. When you have the root cause, the hope is that then you can very, in a very rational fashion, make decisions on how to fix it. Yeah. And then there are a million steps in between. Right, you know, right. Like COVID, mm -hmm. since we're living through another COVID hell in South Florida right now, you got to know the virus first. You got to pin it down. This right. is this is the COVID virus. And then, only then you can develop treatments or vaccines. It's that simple. Yeah, yeah. Now, so, to put in perspective, too, for our listeners, right, when you say it's that simple, the root cause, that's just something that you can figure out overnight, right, in a 24-hour period, and we're good to go, right? Exactly. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point. We always try to put forth with our listeners yeah. that these things take time, right? Yeah. You might be going down one path and you get a failed result, but then you learn from that and you go down another path. So you're constantly navigating, I think, through this complex web to keep the research moving forward. So, Stefan, you know, the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium is part of the Centers of Excellence. They take DNA samples from people. And they house them at the University of Miami and where you look at them, because there's a lot of people who don't know what type of CMT they have, especially, and if I'm correct, it's mostly people with CMT type two. And there's, this is multi-phase questioning. So I was wondering how many genes have been discovered to cause CMT? How many types of CMT are there? And should these people that have these unidentified types, I talk to them all the time. They're like, I don't know. I don't even know if I should get it tested. I'm so discouraged. It takes so much time. And how do you even come up with what type of CMT they have? If half of them haven't been diagnosed, do you think we'll get them all diagnosed at some point? So you want me to answer all of this? All of this. Oh, yeah. You she have about three minutes. a loaded question. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, let, I would break it down a little. Help like, me do that. Try to make it easy, easier to understand, it, hopefully. Going back to 1985, say, CMT was a thing. Doctors would diagnose patients. They could even do the electric studies that are not so pleasant and say, okay, you have CMT1, you have CMT2. They knew that, that these things can run in families. So they, they already knew from just looking at families and talking to families that, okay, this looks like a dominant trait. So it's inherited in a certain fashion. This is recessive. So there was little doubt, it's certain that there are these inherited forms of CMT, okay? Or let's say inherited forms of neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy. As this became more of a attention of science, they developed this, this term CMT and said, okay, those that run in families that look genetic, just from studying families, you can actually almost certainly say this has to be genetic. And you can even say this has to be one single gene. You can tell this from just talking to patients and analyzing pedigrees and, and family history. And that was the case in 85. And then in the early 90s, the first gene was mapped and then also isolated. It was the PMP22 gene. Not surprisingly, so that's the most common form of CMT. It causes CMT type 1. And frankly, people thought at the time, they probably thought, well, we figured it out. Job done. Mission accomplished. Right. And then they started testing, which was expensive and it's not easy at the time because of the technology wasn't there. But then eventually, pretty quickly, they realized, gosh, not all the CMT1 families have problem with PMP22. Oh, there's probably a second gene. How exciting is that? And they kept looking. And then they found a couple of years later, they found MPC, the myelin protein zero. Which and is 1B, right? 1B. And then uh, okay. they thought, okay, that's it now, right? But no. Then scientists thought, there must be more genes. And of course, as we know, there are many more genes. And for, for CMT1, it turned out that we pretty quickly could diagnose maybe 80 to 90% of patients. But for CMT2, that was not the case. The first gene was only discovered in 2000 or so. And then mitofusin was discovered in 2003 and 2004, I think they published it. 
my diffusion explains maybe 20% of patients. So then we kept looking and we found another one and another one. And that is just how things turned out to be that for better or worse, there are many different genes. And I want to say this very clearly because sometimes this is easy to be confused. Each CMT patient has only one gene that is not working correctly. So when we say there are many CMT genes, that means so there are different types of CMT patients, basically. One has my diffusion too, the uh, problem with that, the other have PMP22. Very different genes, but the outcome can be very similar. So that's that's how it works. There are now over a hundred CMT genes. Over a hundred? Over a hundred. And are there many more you feel to that have so, yet to be discovered? Well, frankly, nobody knows. No one else, right? But we can make guesses. So for CMT type one, we can now today diagnose maybe nine out of ten patients. It's pretty good. Hmm. It's pretty routine. You know, they get a clinical diagnosis from a dead doctor, get it, then they get a genetic test, which is a panel. So you test many genes in one go. It's standardized clinical test in large laboratories, and they give you an answer nine out of 10 of the time. For CMT2, sometimes it's a little hard to estimate, but we think that less than 50% of patients actually get a positive test back. Positive meaning they have a problem with one of the 100 genes that are currently known. So thinking that most likely you first hit the genes that are more common. So maybe then the remainder is even more rare. Could there be another another hundred CMT genes? Maybe some hmm. people think that's that's the case. It is also interesting because we put ourselves also a little bit in, in a box when we think about this, like we all tend to do. For instance, we make certain assumptions. Mainly when, when people, geneticists, talk about CMT genes, they really only look at the genes and the only the what we call the coding part. That's the most important piece that creates the protein. But it is entirely conceivable, and there are examples, that these changes, these mutations, could be in the non-coding part. So mostly people don't look for that. And not so because it never occurred to them, but because it's so hard to interpret, to understand what these non-coding changes mean. There are now examples of CMT genes where it's not even your typical mutation. It's a very weird change that we call, for instance, repeat expansions or structural variations. So it's not just a little bit of the genome is sort of wrong. But there's an entire stretch that's that's behaving wrongly. And there are examples of this now in CMT and other diseases. It's very hard to measure these things from a technical perspective, and they often are in non-coding parts. So one good example for this, for, for those of you who are more, more into the detail, is the repeat expansion in the RFC1 gene. And it has been published as CANVAS, C-A-N-V-A-S, CANVAS syndrome. But the top clinicians, CMT doctors in the world think that Canvas is mainly actually a type of CMT. Wow, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So how do you go about, like, you have all these DNA samples. How do you discover these new genes for families? How, how does that work? It's automated now, right? But I yeah. don't really know what that means. I'm sure it's not as manual as it was back in the 80s, right? Or even earlier. Yeah, so... Before this so-called next generation sequence method or technology, before that, it, it was very much piece by piece and very manual. And it was hard to use computers in a systematic fashion. And then this new technology came along where you can sequence entire genomes. Now it's so perfected that we can here in Miami, we sequence entire genomes for $900 routinely. $900 is really the chemistry you need to create it. There's a lot of work around it, but still, it, this is huge. So the data you get out of this is actually, it reads like a text file, hmm. uh, like an ASCII file or so. It, it's really just, it's a computer file that is very good to analyze systematically in a computer. It's almost like a text block in a way. Yeah. 
So, so you, it's almost the, the task is, you know, imagine you have a PDF document with a text that you can read, but, but it's just a different language. It's, it's the language of your genome. And the task is, so now you have several hundred of these little books or documents. And inside, in each document, there's, there's spelling error that is critical. Um. And now you have to go through all these text files and compare these spelling, find these spelling errors and then compare them. And then maybe when you see the same spelling error in multiple documents, you say, oh, here's something that that is not random. So part of it is still manual. After you get that report, then you have to scan it for error, the error or errors and then match it with other people that have that same error. Yeah. Right. It is still, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. It is, is manual in a different way. It happens in a computer, but somebody has to sit in front of the computer. Yeah. And, and those people have changed. It used to be quite easy in my mind, but now it's specialists. And I have to say, because expensive specialists, those are the people who are programmers and data experts. There are not enough of those in the world. And we compete with Google and with, with the big pharma companies mm-hmm. for the same yeah. thing, but we need them. They have very special skills and they, they analyze these large data files. Hmm. And then in my experience, you still need many eyes of experts to look at the data. So I'm a big believer in that. Right now, we're all talking artificial intelligence, not quite there. Right now, it's very good to have many eyes looking at the data. And that's sort of what we do. We gather this data, we prepare it so it's in the right format, contains as little errors as possible. And then we, we, we look at it in our team. There are multiple people who look at it, but we also offer it to other colleagues to look at, at the data, to find, to think about these spelling errors. And I've seen it again and again that students or postdocs or anybody read on a team fishes out these things, you know. Yeah. Bringing this down to our listeners in terms of, you know, Stefan, you're so active right in this field. And if I'm an individual with CMT, I'm thinking, how important is it the research that you're doing to the CMT community, right? How important is your research? And we always think back to the ultimate goal is to find a cure to hopefully find treatments, slow progression, et cetera. And it sounds like as I'm listening, a lot of this really starts with that gene identification, right? And in the absence of that, we probably without your type of research and the folks you collaborate with, we probably would have no chance of even moving forward in terms of our ultimate goal. So yeah, and let's talk about therapy a little bit. I know this is, of course, sure. really on your mind. This simple idea, find a root cause and then right. tackle it. Up to now, really, mainly we have succeeded to find root causes and we have found many. Unfortunately, many, not just three, that we better because then we could focus on tackling those. Now we have over 100 and many patients still don't have a root cause. Hmm. That's where we definitely want to help them. And we're making progress. And you, Liz, you mentioned this success last year with the sword. You know, that the was, spear. again, the, the spear or something. We want to hear more about that. Just yeah. for our listeners, I said mm-hmm. sword. We mean S-O-R-D, not your yeah. standard sword, which we joked about at the beginning yeah. of this podcast. No, I, this is a, a, so this is the abbreviation for this gene, which spelled out stands for sorbitol dehydrogenase, in case you wonder. Okay. But we have another joke around sword. It sort of makes sense, you know? It does. <laughs> that sort of makes sense. That was there good. We that go. was good. I like it. I like it. It took, me, like it. It took <laughs> me a second there, too. I'm like, whoa, good. That's a yeah. good one. Sword was a big surprise, also. 100% was only possible to discover because the researchers came together and shared the data. And then, exactly what I said happened. We had a fellow, very talented fellow, Andrea Cortese, coming here, working with us for for a year in Miami. He's actually in London. And he looked at the data, another pair of eyes. So he and and another postdoc here in the lab, he had already sort of focused in on, on on a bunch of genes, but he came with fresh eyes and even without knowing that, he said, well, this looks funny. It's, it's, it, what, is, what is going on here? 
And it led to our discovery of this new CMT gene, like, okay, number 101. But then it turned out that this gene explains 5 to 10% of the subtype of CMT2. When you have less sensory problems, you know, with, with touch and feel, and more weakness, when weakness is your main symptom. So 10% of patients we screened typically found 10% of cases. That is big. So, and there was another genetic speciality about this gene. Typically, we see many different mutations. This gene has also different mutations, but there's one mutation that is almost always there. When this happens, we can actually estimate how common this mutation is in the population. And I have very good data that supports that there must be some 3,000 people in the United States have stored CMT. Okay. So, so that makes SORT actually the most common recessive gene for CMT. And that is a surprise because we thought, oh, they get rare and more rare and more rare. And here we go. In 2020, there is a gene that, that is a big one. So that's why I'm thinking it's highly possible that we have some surprises waiting. And it will not be another 100 genes. So there was also some treatment options that you thought of for that. Yeah, and that's a great example. Sometimes you're lucky, and that is really the patients are lucky because it turns out this sword gene is understood. It's an enzyme which is involved in a side pathway of glucose metabolism. So what does it mean? Glucose is a very important sugar, as you know. Your body needs it, especially in nerve cells. They depend on it. And the cells, the neurons, nerve cells, they have different ways of getting the energy out of glucose. And one of the ways is of this sword gene. Now, and this sword gene in those patients is completely non-functional now, which leads to problems that are already understood because it was of a great interest, this gene or this pathway for diabetic neuropathy a different type of peripheral neuropathy caused by diabetes. So we could tap into the knowledge from the diabetic neuropathy field. So in short, we ended up collaborating with a company in Boston, Applied Therapeutics, that coincidentally worked on newer class of drugs that can basically negate the negative functions of losing this this enzyme. It doesn't replace it, but prevents the negative outcome, basically. And this has been studied actually for decades because of wow. the diabetes. So, so we know, it, we, we're quite certain it will work. Even showed in a fly model, now that's kind of crazy. We can create CMT in the fruit flies. The flies in summer, that yeah. you know, when you have a fruit bowl at home right. and, and they, 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 they like that. And there's tiny, tiny flies. Yeah. yeah. So we can create CMT in those, and we were able with this drug to cure these flies. Now, wow. why do we use flies? Because it's bigger and cheaper, really. A mouse study takes years and years. And there's some other studies we did with these skin biopsies that some of you have given to our research. So these skin biopsies are very powerful, and we could also cure these skin biopsies in a petri dish. The company is ready to move forward with some principal, very small clinical trial that happened over the summer. That is just to understand better how the drug works in, in people, if it's safe. And the plan is to actually do some larger def- definite trial uh, later this year. Yeah, that is awesome. So, and, and because of the pre-existing data, I mean, I, I should be a scientist, much more coolish and, and factual and... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm I'm quite excited. This 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 I think this can actually work. Would require taking a pill, a, a tablet, once a day or so for like every day. Mm-hmm. That's uh, amazing. But it has the potential to stop. I'd say I will be careful here. I, I'd say to right. hopefully to stop or slow the worsening of symptoms. Right. Stop um, or slow the progression. So I would say that that would be already amazing. Right. That would be. And maybe we, you know, that we will only see in the, in the years to come if then it works. Maybe we give the body enough resources then to even, maybe even improve. Yeah. 
or, or you know, in the long run, I think in the long run, talking in, for the next generation of children, what we really want to do is detect CMT before they get symptoms, detect a genetic problem, and then be confident about it and discuss with parents that it would be a good idea to start a certain therapy, even though there are no symptoms. But that would then prevent CMT from ever occurring. These are big ideas, but... The, the, yeah, however, but that's, uh, that's, they are that's, promising. So, so the sword, the magic sword... <laughs> the magic sword. Could really, I hope, energize the, the community when it, when it works. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. All the work that you're doing is, is just amazing. Listening to some of your thoughts and even the example with the fruit flies. I mean, those are little things that are really big and powerful that give folks with CMT hope. And we find that all the time when we talk to individuals with CMT. There's a lot of research going on. And the, their biggest question is, you know, and obviously it's hard yeah. to answer. When are you going to find a cure? And when is this going to be solved? But the fact is letting them know that this research is going on and the importance of things that you're doing as well as others really is a significant deal to those with CMT. And I, I think Elizabeth and I could express for, you know, 3 million people worldwide that are extremely thankful for what you do every day, right? So, And, and, and Chris and Liz, I mean, it, it is really day and night. 10 years ago, pharma and the research community, there was little in the so-called pipeline. The mm -hmm. therapeutic pipeline. That has truly changed. There are now gene therapies for some rare forms of CMT. There are related disorders like spinal muscular atrophy. It's for doctors, even though it's different for patients, it's a related dis disease of functioning gene therapies. Industry has many projects now that they want to bring forward. Academia has many more ideas. It feels a bit like a domino game where it flips faster and faster. I think we at the beginnings of the age of therapy. You know, we were in the age of diagnostic, finding the root causes. We see signs that we are entering an age of therapy. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to title this, this episode yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, in exactly. The age of therapy. So, you know, we're closing out and coming to the end of our podcast here. And Stefan, there's so much more I'm sure we could talk to you about or have you explain to us, which makes me think is we'd love to have you back on the podcast. And Lizzo, you had a kind of a question here at the close. We usually ask the folks we interview a number of different things. What are kind of your goals and hopes referencing CMT or identified genes or your scientific work, right? What do you hope for? It's exciting. That what, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm the lucky guy here working in this field, peeling it back more and more and see how this all works, this thing called genome. And I hope that this will even become more automated. So machine learning, artificial intelligence is often used. It's, it's probably overused word, but I, I can see that how we use technology to give more patients an answer and faster. And sometimes, you know, I guess our brains probably are limited. So having some help there from, from, from that side could, could be good. And then I'm very hopeful that these new ideas that are used for genetic therapies, and when I say genetic therapies, it's, it's I think of a family of ideas here gene replacement, I'm sure people have heard, of, you mentioned CRISPR. There are many more of these ideas. As always with drugs is they often die because they're unsafe or toxic. So my hope would be that many of them are safe, that these ideas can actually work because it would really make a huge difference. There, there is tremendous potential with genetic approaches in terms of therapy. I'm, I'm sure actually this will be a game changer. It will take time because of safety. We want to be sure safety comes first and, and all the regulations. And it will be a partnership, Chris. It has yeah, to be. sure. Because the patients, especially in rare diseases like CMT, it's got to be a partnership with patients. Patients become pioneers. When, they, when you have a rare form of CMT and you volunteer in a trial, that's a big personal commitment, right? But right. that you know that that has to happen to make it better for you, hopefully, but also for the next generation. Yeah, these diseases will not go away, you know. 
right. But but we probably will live to see how many of those will be curable. And those patients who went through this age benefit all the generations going forward. So, Well said. That gives me a lot of hope. I'm sure it gives our listeners a lot of hope. Thanks for all your passion and for what you're doing for everybody every day. You really explained a lot. It's obviously very complex to identify these genes, identify treatments, et cetera, but it is very hopeful with the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for joining us on this podcast. I referenced earlier, the entire CMTA community is thankful to have you. And I would say, Danke dear, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> and I great. would reiterate that. that. I would echo that. Yeah, and also because you put your, you know, this is your volunteer work and time and Oh, well, thank you. Thanks so much. Chris, it's also very inspirational. You know, we're doing the Cycle for CMT event. It makes me want to go and make more calls right now. You know, it's right. just very inspirational. So thank you. Regarding our next guest, Chris, I have no clue who we're going to have. Listen, me neither, but we'll figure something out. The CMTA community is full of interesting and passionate people. So, hey, Lizzo, if someone wants to learn more about CMT, where should they go? Well, cmtausa.org, of course. And as you know, it takes a lot of money to fund research. Research, I will say, not research. See, now I'm <laughs> trying to mix my German and British accents and French <laughs> and everything. But it does take a lot of money to fund research in order to find a cure for CMT. And as always, if any of our listeners are so inclined to generously donate to our cause, how would they go about doing that, Lizzo? Well, again, you could go to cmtausa.org or since we're doing the cycle for CMT, it's a year round thing now. It's www.cycleforcmt.com. Fantastic. So do you have a good story? Would you like to tell your story on our CMT for me podcast? If so, write to us info at cmtausa.org. Pitch your idea. We want to hear from you. Awesome, Lizzo. Until next time, folks. Alf Vita Zen. Zang.